a portion of God's Word for our scripture lesson, Isaiah chapter 30. And we want to pick up our reading at verse 18. And my prayer is that God will bless, bless you here tonight for your sacrifice. Still the Lord's day. And nothing should come in his way of giving him his worship. Beginning at verse 18. And therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you. And therefore will he be exalted that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Amen. Blessed are all they that wait for him. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. Thou shalt weep no more. He will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry. When he shall hear it, he will answer thee. And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner anymore. But thine eyes shall see thy teachers, and thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it, when ye turn to the right hand, and when ye turn to the left. Father, once again, we just thank you for your word. Thank you for this opportunity that we can gather around your holy word. And as we gather around your word, and as we enjoy fellowship and communion with you, we ask, Father, that you speak to our hearts. If there's one today who is lost, we ask that you bring them, if it's your will, to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We know you can do it because you saved us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Beautiful, beautiful passage there in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 30 and that 21st verse says, And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it. When you turn to the right hand, and when you turn to the left. And just for this hour, we want to talk about the voice behind thee. The voice behind thee. Another great salvation message. Another evidence of the greatness of how God does when it comes down to his salvation. In this message tonight, we are hopeful that each of you will hear the voice of Christ speaking both warnings and truths to us. In this message, we will see how his voice operates upon the sinner, reaching both his ears and his heart. We will take notice how God calls to the rebellious, and by his gentle word, they are brought to his feet with repentance. They turn from their evil wandering and are led in the way of obedience. How marvelous is God's great love and this great salvation. The phrase there, a word behind thee, and I'm sure that in your reading you have read this before, Isaiah 30 and verse 21, and thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, but that phrase, a word behind thee, is spoken of in this text as one of the covenant blessings found in the everlasting covenant of grace between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this covenant has its basis in what we call the everlasting council that took place before this covenant. This council met in eternity. There God met with himself. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And in this meeting they planned and they advised what need to be done and they all made an agreement what they would do in this covenant. See, but this council did not take long. Before it started, it had ended. See, when we sit down and consult among ourselves, it takes a moment. It takes some time, doesn't it? Not a moment, but it takes some time. Sometimes to decide what color we want to have for the carpet. But with God, when it came down to this plan, this, by the time this council started, it ended. Because all was in agreement with what they need to do in this covenant concerning the salvation of men. This covenant blessing, a word behind thee, is one of those gracious, unconditional promises upon which the salvation of the guilty depends. These words... That phrase, a word behind thee, is also understood to be God, the Holy Spirit. 
At this moment, let us admire the free and sovereign grace of God in making such a promise to a people whom he speaks of earlier in verse 9. You turn to uh, Isaiah 3 and look at verse, verse 9. He graciously speaks to them, but prior to that, he, he called them a rebellious people. Lying children, and children that would not hear the law of the Lord. And we see how gracious God is to every one of us. Charles Spurgeon says, and thine ears shall hear a word behind thee. He, saying, he says, God's grace is marvelous in itself. And that's true. But it is most marvelous when it chooses to run down into the sea of sin and makes the water pure. See how marvelous God's grace is in our lives. How he can take a wretched person like me and you and make us pure. That's how marvelous his grace is. This is what salvation does. But I want to take note of how God deals with the lost sinners. How God dealt with us. How God dealt with me. When I was in this position. Note number one, the position of the sinner. That's how God deals with the lost sinner. Note the position of the sinner. It says, and thy ears shall hear a word behind thee. The sinner position is always, uh, I'm referring to the unregenerate, is always with their back turned to God. I want to talk about that for a moment. Note the position of the sinner to whom this special blessing comes. How does God find men? He finds them with their back turned to him. And that's how he found me. See, I didn't find him. I'm the one that was lost. <laughs> Somebody said, well, I found them. I said, well, you got the wrong God. The word behind is very interesting. It's used here as an adverb. And that adverb always suggests the backside of something. So behind the center, that voice was coming from behind them. And we are reminded very clearly of the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 3. The last part of verse 11 and the first part of, of verse 12. He says, there is none that seeketh after God. They are gone out of the way. He was speaking to the unregenerate. John Gill said this about this phrase, seek it after God. He says, this speaks of the lost man who tried to seek God without the aid of grace. And I'm here today to tell you, without God's help, you will not be able to save yourself. You're not, you know, the condition that you're in, you need help. Without God's grace, none of us will be able to worship God in spirit and in truth. None of us will be able to seek him chiefly. And in the first place, with their whole heart, earnestly, constantly. But they are gone out of the way. Speaks of out of the way of God and his precepts. And this is our condition prior to salvation. The sinner has gone away from God and God calls after him from behind. Notice the sinner turns his back on God, but yet God remains as he is. After having sinned willfully and wickedly, the sinner turns his back on God and truth. But according to the complaint that God made in Jeremiah chapter 32 and verse 33, he says, And they turned unto me the back, and not the face. So I taught them, rising up early and teaching them, yet they have not hearkened to receive instructions. The unregenerate does not want to hear God's truth. You can expect the unregenerate to be rebellious when it comes down to the things of God. Because in that condition, in that state, they are enemies to God. They hate God. And we was once in that state. But listen to this. When the sinner turns his back on God, he turns his back on God's word, on the gospel, on mercy, on eternal life, on the adoption of the Father, on forgiveness of sin brought with the blood of Jesus Christ, on regeneration wrought by the Holy Spirit, on holiness, on happiness, and even they turn their back on heaven. But the sinner seeks not God. 
but his God seeks him. And I, and, 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 and I love that because before I got saved, I never desired God. I didn't seek him, but he sought me out. Man turns from the God of love, but the love of God turns no one away. Not only does the sinner has his back turned towards God, but I found out in my studies that the sinner constantly moves away from God. Not only does the sinner has his back turned towards God, but he loves to roam and to get farther as he can from God. The sinner is not content to be near God, even with his back to God. And therefore, he was run as fast as he can from God. And the first example that we had of this can be found in the book of Genesis. Can be seen in Adam, our federal head, after he had sinned and fallen. In Genesis 3 and 8, we, we read, And they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. They were conscious of their guilt, but yet they imagined falsely that they, that they could flee from the presence of God. But I'm here to tell you that God is everywhere. Yes, he is. By hiding themselves behind that tree was useless. And that taught me that Adam and Eve attempted to secure themselves from the wrath of God. And they were ignorant of the fact, and the reason why they did it on their own, because they were ignorant of the fact of the justifying righteousness and the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's why it's very important that the lost hear us proclaim the justifying righteousness of Christ and the atoning sacrifice that he made on Calvary. Just like the prodigal in Luke 15 and 13, the sinner is not satisfied until he gets into a far country. John Gill says a far country sets forth the state of separation and the sinner, while he is unconverted, fail to realize that this is the fact, that he is far off from God, he is far off from his presence, and even far off from the communion with him. But in order to, to, to bring fellowship and communion with God, it takes the work of God's grace. And this is evidence that, that God loves us. And not only when God found me that I had my back turned to him and that I was running from him, but also found out when I analyzed verse 20 a lot closer, that they pursued their course even in spite of the warning. It was very hard-headed. Look there at verse 20. Isaiah 30 and 20 says, And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a far corner anymore, but thy eyes shall see thy teachers. Now, but before this proclamation was made by the Holy Spirit, they had their teachers. They had their preachers. And the teachers and preachers were doing their job. Standing there proclaiming what thus said the Lord. Preaching the gospel of salvation. And even today, people respond the same way towards the preacher by not being interested in what he is saying. Well, I'm going to say this here. I don't know how many messages it took before I got saved. You know, I would hear these sermons being proclaimed over and over again, and nothing would happen. And you know why? Because we're going to find out here in this lesson that something else has to go along with the preaching of the gospel before one can be effectively moved. But the words that teach her in the Hebrew is very interesting. It pictures one shooting an arrow, by the way. And before you shoot that arrow, you have to aim it exactly to where you want it to go. And that's just like aiming and finger pointing, providing instructions. This is what the teachers were doing. They were in their right place. They were doing the work of their office. But right here in this passage of Scripture, right here in that verse, where it says that 
yet shall not thy teachers be removed in the corner anymore, but thy eyes shall see thy teachers. Right there is beginning a work of God in the heart of those who are listening. Very important. Without God doing a proud work in our heart and our life, no way that we will be able to come to Christ. It has to be a proud work. Jesus said, no man can come unto me except the Father draweth me. Now, they could see their physical teachers with their physical eyes, but nothing happened. But yet, there is a call of mercy that I want to take a look at here. And thy ears shall hear a word behind thee. Hear a word. That is the call of mercy. The call of mercy is always a call undesired by the sinner. I wasn't expecting this call that I received, that I heard, and I'm sure you wasn't. The sinner who has gone astray did not desire this call. Well, I'm going to keep running until God called me. No, no, no. That, that wasn't never in my mind. My mind was trying to get away as far as I can from God and from his people. Election has to do with purposing and planning of salvation. But the atonement has to do with the provision of it. And we must keep that in mind. But we must now look at the application and communication of salvation to the believer. I believe that's very important. Therefore, we will heed to the Holy Scriptures which speak clearly of two different calls. The outward and the inward call. And the first one in order of occurrence that we want to talk about is the outward or the external call. Now, I'm not going to take time to give you all of the scriptures concerning the outward call that is mentioned in the scriptures, but I'm just going to give you a few. Isaiah 45 and 22, which says, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else, the outward call. Isaiah 55 and 6, Seek ye the Lord, while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Matthew 11 and 28, I will call. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew 22 and 14 says, For many are called, but few are chosen. The outward call. Luke 5 and 32, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And then finally there, Revelation 22, verse 17 says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Now, the outward call, by the way, is also named the external call or the general call. The outward call is simply God's offer of grace to sinners, inviting them to come and trust Christ and be saved. And this outward call is given through the preaching of the gospel by which God calls sinners to repentance. And this is what we're doing here by way of preaching. By way of preaching the gospel, this is the outward call. This is the general call. See, the preaching of the gospel makes it clear that man is in need of salvation, and it comes through Jesus Christ alone. This preaching provides man with the fact that he has a responsibility under God to believe the gospel and to repent of his sin, and that will never change. That's man, whether he's saved or not, that's his responsibility, to believe the gospel and repent of his sin. Now, the outward call is an indirect call of the Holy Spirit. That means it does not come directly from the Holy Spirit. It is a general call. But yet, when the Holy Spirit gets ready to use, we're going to talk about that in the other call, that he will use it. But listen to this. By this, when we say general call, by this we mean that it is not confined to the elect. And that's why I, I, uh, when it comes down to sharing the gospel, you know, I'm not concerned about whether somebody that is the elect or not. I don't have the time to worry about that because I don't know. But it's our duty and responsibility is to share the gospel with all that we come in contact with. But listen to this. We are commanded to preach the gospel to all who has the physical ears to hear. But even though we are commanded to do this, but I want to say all will not hear. And this call, by the way, is always ineffective. 
Preaching the gospel alone is not enough. There has to be some work done. And we're going to see that in that next call. Listen to this. An example of this. Isaiah 65 and 12. Therefore will I number you to the sword, and ye shall all bow down to the slaughter, because when I called, ye did not answer. When I spake, you did not hear. But did evil before my eyes, and did choose that wherein I delighted not. And once again, this call referred here is to the outward call. And because of man's depravity, the preaching of the gospel alone is never sufficient to bring him to Christ. He needs more than an outward call. And nevertheless, but it is the duty of all to accept this call, by the way. Acts 17 and 30 says, And the times of this ignorance God winked at but now commanded all men everywhere to repent. And let me give you some examples of the inward call that's found in the word. I'm not going to give you all, but just only a few. Acts chapter 2, verse 39. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That's the end we call. Romans 8 and 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Romans 8 and 30. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. The end we call. 1 Peter 1 and 15, but as he which have called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Now, the inner call is a direct call through the Holy Spirit. I have nothing to do with that. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit takes the preached gospel and began opening the heart of the sinner. This is the Holy Spirit works. How do you know that? Well, Acts chapter 16, verse 14 says, and a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Tower Tower, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened. The Lord has to open the heart. I cannot open your heart. The Holy Spirit applies the word to the heart in what we call regenerating power. It is the work of the Holy Spirit to make known the gospel to the lost elect who are naturally blind to the truth and unable to comprehend. That's the Holy Spirit job. He enabled them to understand the way of salvation. The unsaved must understand that salvation depends upon faith in Christ alone. And the unsaved must understand that the righteousness of God is made available for the sinner only through Jesus Christ. And the unsaved must face the fact of judgment and find in Christ one who was judged and executed as their substitute. He took my place is what I'm trying to say. It is then and only then that the believer is able to understand and receive the things of the Spirit of God. It is the Holy Spirit work in the believer to help him to understand these things. But let me say this here. The outward call can be resisted, but the inward call is always effective and can never be resisted. Now I want to talk about this call of mercy again, and you're going to agree with me on this. But the call of mercy is the voice of an unseen caller. It is not the teachers that speak in this powerful way. The teachers, they saw what their eyes had done them no good. But the caller here is someone who they never saw and never will until he chooses to reveal himself to sin. And Paul is an example of one who was saved without the outward call. Acts 9 and 6, Paul, who was known as Saul, asked the question during this conversion, during his conversion, who art thou, Lord? So he didn't know who it was. And Jesus graciously revealed himself to Saul in verse 6 and said, I am Jesus whom thou persecuted. I'm sure you know the story. But take note that the caller speaks a word that cannot be kept out of the ears of the sinner. It will come to the sinner unexpectedly and wake him out of his spiritual sleep. This is what the inward call does. The call of mercy is a word from the hidden one. You cannot see who is speaking, and you cannot shut your ears to his 
admonition nor refuse his warning. He will reveal himself and make himself known to us. And that's why there should be a desire in us to know more about Jesus. And I found out that the voice of the caller also pursues and overtake the sinner, even though we are running away from him. As the sinner runs with all his might to his destruction, the voice follows him. And I'm, I'm so glad that God's voice followed me. I didn't know what I was doing, but I kept running. He runs faster from the voice, which shows his determination to carry out his own will. That's what I was doing, and that's what you was doing. As the sinner hears this voice, he does not understand how and why this voice comes to him, but it is a fulfillment of the promise that we read. It is the word behind him. And you know that the sinner delay to come, but God does not delay to call. And as I close this second point, it is necessary that the word should be spoken and be heard. For the sinner has seen his teachers, but they, were, but they were ineffective. If sinners had nothing to say to them but us poor preachers, none of, none of you and none of them would be brought up from death and hell. But the word behind us is needful, in which no mortal man can speak but God himself. And therefore, uh, I believe we should pray to the Holy Spirit that he may breathe on men and save them. And then let's take a look at the words spoken and then we're going to get ready to conclude. The words spoken by the caller are very important words. And this is what we talked about in our nursing home ministry. This is the way. Walk ye in it. Let's talk about that just for a few moments. The call contains specific instructions. Remember now, this is the inward call, which is, a direct, which is a call directly through the Holy Spirit. God in this call lays down a definite pathway, is what I'm trying to say. Definite instructions are given. This is the way. And that pronoun, this, is always used to identify a specific person that is being indicated here. And that person that is being indicated here is no other than Jesus Christ. And this phrase directly speaks of Christ, who in John 14, said, and 14 or 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Christ is the only way of life and salvation. And this way must be walked by faith. This way requires the path of duty and doctrine, which to walk in it is both pleasant and profitable, because Christ is the right way. This is the way. That is, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. This is the way. Repent and be converted, every one of you. This is the way. Leave sin, quit self, and trust in Christ. And I can't make that no simple than what I just said. But sometimes the voice also gives a special correction. And I love that because many people will say that there are several ways that you can, can get into heaven. I don't say anything. I just look at them because they know I'm not going to respond. Because that's not, that's not true. But if you take a look at what Jesus said, he can, he can correct you on that. John 14 and 6, I am the way. That's enough right there. Jesus said, I am the way. The way means only one. There's not several ways into heaven. There's not several ways into salvation. Not only is Jesus the way, but Jesus also said, I am the door. He didn't say, I am the doors, <laughs> but I am the door. One single door. One single way. And Christ provides those who believe that there are several ways to heaven with a special correction. I am the way. And since he is the way, what he is saying is this, that I am the way of salvation, simply by my obedience and sacrifice on Calvary. He is the way because the Father appointed him to be the way. He is the way because he is agreeable to the perfections of God. He is the way because he is suitable to the case and condition of sinners. In order to come to Christ, one must come by faith in him. He is the way to heaven. He has entered into heaven himself by his own blood and has opened the way to heaven through himself for his people. 
And I'm here today to say, if you're going the wrong way, turn from it, and ye shall live. And I'm not playing. We ought to thank God that the gospel comes in as a corrective and destroys the false and introduces us to the truth. Let us leave all other roads since God has said there's only one road. This is the way. And now, if you know that this voice follow up with a personal direction, after he said, this is the way, and it follow up by saying, walk ye in it. Same thing my mom always tells me when I go and do it the way that I want to do it. She said, listen, boy, this is the way. And this is the way that you're going to do it. And after she says that, guess what happened? I do it exactly the way that she say do it. Because I know what would happen. But when it comes down to men, men are spiritual. Men like to take what's in this book and change it to their own desire, their own comfort. But I cannot change what's in this book. I got to preach it exactly as it is. Walk thee in it. Here is the doctrine, <laughs> is what the Holy Spirit is saying. Once you get saved, and you know, and, and, and I, I like that because salvation is a work of, of, of God. Only God can do this. But I, I do believe that once you get saved, once you, there's a, a, a conversion that takes place after regeneration, I believe that your desires also changes. And I believe that you ought to have a love for what's in this book. Amen. I believe that this book ought to be read more than these other books that we got in our homes. Amen. And you go visit some homes, they got more dust on the Holy Bible. And I say, you got some, look at all that dust you got on the Bible. You got so much dust on there, all you got to do is take some seeds and drop it. And I get a cup of water and pour it on it, and I have a flower garden. But that, isn't that sad? Yes, it is, brother. Use this. Here's the doctrine. Now practice it. And then finally... The success of the call. Look at this here, the end of the call. Is it always effective and successful? Yes. But the outward call is not. And remember now, this verse is the inward call. The internal call, the call that the Holy Spirit gives. But look what it says here, the success is found. When we speak of success, by the way, we are speaking of the accomplishment of the aim of the inward call. And conversion to Christ happens simply by virtue of the effectual call by which the Holy Spirit works with saving power to bring the unbelieving sinner to faith. Effectual calling is the call of men out of darkness to light. Effectual calling takes place first. And you know what I found out in my studies? There's, regeneration doesn't do that, but conversion answers that call, by the way. Effectual call and calls one out of darkness to his marvelous light. But what conversion does is answers that and turns that person. Did you know that? The actual turn. And R.C. Sproul says this. He says, the unregenerate experience the outward call of the gospel. This outward call will not affect salvation unless the call is heard and embraced in faith. Effectual calling refers to the work of the Holy Spirit in regeneration. The regenerate are called inwardly. Everyone who receives the inward call of regeneration responds in faith. I agree with that 100%. John Murray also says this as we get ready to close. He says this concerning the saving call of God. Since this call is effectual, it carries with it the effective grace whereby the person called is enabled to answer the call and to embrace Jesus Christ as he is freely offered in the gospel. I love that, that effectual call. I love that. I can now answer that call because of the grace that's in me because of conversion. Regeneration, then conversion. Then what happens? Then I find myself turning from darkness into his marvelous light. And then, listen to this. Finally, as the voice continues to speak, it pulls him up and leads to a firm course of action. He is determined to settle upon heaven. This is the course that I want. I want heaven. 
Now I can hear him say in Luke 15 and 18, I will arise and go to my father. This is what the affliction called the results of it. I will arise and go to my father. Are you listening? This is the resolution the prodigal came into through divine grace. It was divine grace. He couldn't do it on his own, apart from grace, by the way. He determined to quit the country and his ungodly and worldly friends. He had left the harlots and his old course of living. And let it be said of you the same as the prodigal did. Not only did he say, I will arise and go to my father, but note his action. His action. He arose and came to his father. That's what the affliction calling would do. His resolution to arise was out of grace. It wasn't free will, but it was grace that worked on him, made him willing, desiring to come to his father. Somebody today need this work. If you're lost, you need this work, need this desire. Let's don't talk saying, I will arise and go to my father. Let's respond. He arose and came to his father. His resolution was put into execution and he came to his own father. I love that. I love that. Brother Richard.